You may be wondering why I'm dressed like a doctor today. It's not because I play a doctor on TV or am a real doctor of any kind. It really is just to make a point. And you know that I do this occasionally where I wear something or I bring something up here, hopefully so that you can see a, a visual image that you can take with you that will remind you about what I talked about today. It's called an object lesson. The church council worked uh, through the end of last year talking about what we wanted to do in 2015, and we decided to focus on checking our vitals. Now, what are your vitals? Your vitals are your insides. And it's what the doctor checks when you go to the doctor. He takes your blood pressure, he checks your pulse, he looks in your eyes and your ears and your nose, he he may feel around in your abdominal cavity, he'll check your reflexes. Why is he doing that? Because those are the first things to show symptoms of a bigger problem. So they're checking your vital signs. If you've ever been in the emergency room as a patient with a significant reason, you'll know that immediately they'll hook you up to all of these machines. And there'll be beeps and boinks and and toots and horns going on all around you. And there's wires coming off your chest and your arms and your ankles. You know, what in the world are they doing? Well, they're making sure that they're paying attention to all of your vital signs while they do their best to diagnose what's going on with you. This past week, I wasn't feeling very well. I felt like that. Just miserable. And all it was was just a head cold. But sometimes I think I'd rather have the flu than the cold. Because at least the flu, you know you're really sick. The cold, you've got to keep going. But your head hurts and you're stuffy and your nose is running and your joints are anky. I could have gone to the doctor and said, Doc, what's wrong? And he would have checked my vitals. And he would have looked up my nose and would have looked in the back of my throat and said, Yeah, you've got some post-nasal drip back there. Your throat's all red and your sinuses are uh, irritated. Your ears are a little stuffy. Your eyes are a little runny. Say, John, you have a cold. Diagnose me right there. Okay? That's what he paid $127,000 to be a doctor and get one of these coats so he could tell me I have a cold. You know, but he's there for when major things happen too. Most of you know, a couple days it'll be six years, And I had a major heart attack right on the parking lot here. And um, ambulance came and they they took me to the hospital. And uh, they said, you know, what's hurting? What's going on? And I told them my symptoms and they knew immediately I was having a heart attack. And, And I remember them wheeling a cart in to the emergency room that had the defibrillator paddles on it. I was going, I don't need those. I'm, I'm still alive. And they put the, those, I, I thought they were like aluminum or something, but they put those pads on me to where the paddles would go. I mean, they slapped those suckers on right away, and uh, they put the EKG machine on me, and, and they were giving me intravenous medications to try to alleviate uh, the, the heart attack. But nothing alleviated the pain until I was actually in the um, angioplast room and they put that stint in. And immediately when they put that stint in, all the pain went away. None of the medicine they gave me helped. None of the attention they gave me helped. But when they performed that procedure, it was like, oh, wow feel better I couldn't have done that for myself the immediate care clinic down on the corner 
could not have performed that procedure on me. Going to my regular doctor, the internist, he could not have done that for me. It took a specialist in a special place with special care and special tools and special techniques to stop my heart from attacking. You know, and that's what people need the church for too. They need the church to be a special place at a special time with special tools. Sometimes to stop their heart from aching. As we move forward into 2015, we're going we're to concentrate on a few areas. Vital worship, vital discipleship, and vital service. And how as a church to function as a healthy trauma center, as a healthy hospital for the spiritually ill, we have to be appropriately prepared to meet those needs. Which means we need to be connected with the ultimate physician. And we need to be educated in his techniques of healing. And then we need to serve. And it's a continual process in life as a Christian. And what it takes is daily, daily, daily spending time with the Master. Spending time with God. You know, every doctor has to go through continuing education. And there's a new machine that comes up. I remember um, when Bob was still working before he retired. And uh, it was some years ago. But I remember him telling me about a, a new um, imaging machine. That, that sort of came into the area. And I think you and only one other guy in the city were trained on it. You know, say a regular radiologist would go in to this machine. He wouldn't know what to do with it. He hadn't been trained on it. See, God is continually wanting to train us in His service. And we've got to continually come back to Him in worship and in study so that we are prepared to go and do what He wants us to do. Being a member of the faith isn't all about doing. It's about learning. And it's about loving. And then it's about doing. It's about being filled up so that you can be poured out. Now I'll ask a rhetorical question because this would probably be hard to raise your hand on. But how many of you are an empty vessel today? How many of you took your life and you, and you emptied it out right now, nothing would come out because you're already empty? I venture a guess that some of you are like that. See, and it's, it's God that can fill you up. It's not my sermon that's going to fill you up. Absolutely not. It's not the songs we sang today that's going to fill you up. It's not even the prayers of, of your partner or your friend that's going to fill you up. God is the only thing, person, one, entity, being that can fill you up. And you have to come to Him for that. And what a beautiful place to come to, to be filled. See, if, if while I'm preaching today and you're empty, what I'd encourage you to do is to stop listening to me. And just right where you are, just begin asking God, God, fill me up. I am so empty. Help me, help me, God, right now. Fill me with your spirit. Fill me with your love. Fill me with your peace. Fill me with your comfort. Because that's so much more important than anything I have to say today. Or anything any other doctor in a hospital could do for you today. 
this is your emergency room this morning. And the great physician is here to serve you. So if there are some of you that are, are going to go about that task, you go ahead, even as I continue. As a Christian church, as Christians and as individuals, our prescription for the future was our scripture for this morning. Romans 1 and 2 of chapter 12 says, Therefore, I urge you, men and women, brothers and sisters, male and female alike, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices. It means to pour yourself out. To pour yourself out. Because this is pleasing to God. But you might ask, how can I pour myself out if I'm already empty? Don't conform any longer to the patterns of this world. They won't fill you up. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Which means focus on God. Then, then, you'll be filled up. It says then you will be able to test and approve God's will. Then you will be in the office of the doctor, being treated for your illness, and being cured of what ails you. This is going to be a verse that you'll see run through the entire year of 2015. We'll refer back to it on multiple times. There's other, a few others, though, I want to talk about. Remember I said vital worship, vital discipleship, and vital service? You turn your Bible to John chapter 4, verse 23, the scripture says, Yet a time is coming, and has now come, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. All of our healing begins in worship. Anything that ails us, any cure we seek spiritually, physically, emotionally, relationally, begins with worship. Corporately, as a church, individually, in the home. You can say, well, well Dr. John, what does that look like? Well, that's as unique as a medication you need. The worship that you need to enter into is so specific to you that only God can write that prescription. I can't say, do A, B, and C, and you'll be in worship, and everything will be fine, because that doesn't work for everybody. You know, in, in seminary or in worship conferences, they'll, they'll teach you, now you want to start with these kind of songs... Okay? You want to get everybody excited. You want to get everybody moving around. You want to get their blood flowing. And it's really exciting and energetic. And, and, and then you want to transition to this kind of song. It gets everybody thinking. It gets everybody, you know, processing. And it, it sort of brings them down a little bit. And then you want to transition to these real emotional songs where you pull these people down and you start tugging on their heartstrings, then they'll be in worship. Okay? That works at this guy's church. That may not work at my church. And that may not work in your life. So as you meet the great physician in his office today, you need to take the prescription that he gives you. He may say, I need you to spend time in, in my word. That's the worship I need from you. He may say, I just need you to listen. I need you to be silent before me and let me speak into your heart. That 
may be the worship that you need, the prescription that will, will begin your transformation to healing. He may say, I need you just to celebrate and be happy and joyful. You know what? Don't you have another prescription? I don't like that one. Ah, he says, that's the one for you. You need to be happy. So I want you to sing and I want you to dance and I want you to raise your hand. Vital worship is what God seeks from His people. Worshiping in spirit and in truth. No masks during worship. No, no faking it. Because the great physician sees the truth. He knows what ails you. And he knows what you need to be well. Vital discipleship, that second thing that we're going to focus on again in and out throughout the year. Testing and approving what God's perfect and pleasing will is. Renewing our minds, transforming our thoughts through the study of God's word. Through interaction with each other. Sharpening our swords against each other. Because remember, when we leave here, we're out uh, back in the battlefield again. He said, ah, battlefield, that's silly. I work at 7-Eleven. There's no battles going on at 7-Eleven. Yes, there are. Every day there's a battle wherever you are. In your classroom, there are spiritual battles going on. In, in your work environment, there are spiritual battles going on. In your home, there are spiritual battles going on. That you are called to fight. So we need to sharpen our swords and prepare our weapons and put on our armor while we were here in the safe area so that when we go back out to the battlefield, we will be properly equipped. Part of that's discipleship. Learning and teaching and growing with each other. And honestly, the service is the battle. Farther into Romans chapter 12 are some additional verses. It says in verse 4 and following, For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it's serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. If it's encouraging, then give encouragement. If it's giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. And if it's to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Well, that's the same thing like a hospital. You go into a hospital with a heart problem, they're not going to call a gastroenterologist to treat you. If you go in with a broken leg, they're not going to call a pediatrician to set the bone. They're going to call that specialist. Well, God, through Paul, is saying that same thing, that we all have been gifted specially. And we need to use those gifts and according to the gifting to make us all a healthier community of faith. Not everybody can teach, and that's okay. But if you are called to teach, you need to teach. Honestly, not everybody's able to give generously. But if God's called you to be a giver, give and give and give. If you're called to be an encourager, then encourage others every day. It's like a hospital, it's like a battlefield, it's like a church, it's the way God has arranged things. So as we go to serve, don't serve out of your specialty, serve in your specialty. Now, if I go to the doctor and my leg is broken and the orthopedic is on vacation, okay, 
They can call another doctor in. Let's say they call an internist in who happened to, during medical school, taken a special extended internship in, in uh, what is it again? Orthopedics. Okay? And he comes in and says, I'm an internist, but I was going to be an orthopedist before I went to intern, and I can set your leg. Now, I'm going to be a little uncomfortable with that. But as he begins to work and, you know, talk, and that way it sounds like he knows what he's doing. Okay? There are going to be times in your life where you are called to step out of that special area of service off to the side a little bit because you're the only one to meet that need today. And that's okay. God will give you what you need to, to do that service, to, to complete that task, and then he'll move you back to your special gifting area. And some of you have multiple gifts where you can operate in multiple areas. But all of us have a place to serve. In the Gospel of Mark, second chapter, starting in verse 16, it says, When the teacher of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And on hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have come not to call the righteous, but the sinners. I was losing my stethoscope there. If I, as a healthy individual, walk into an emergency room and I say, well, what's wrong? And you go, nothing. I say, why are you here? Uh, well, nothing's wrong, but I think I need to be in the emergency room. Well, they'll take you to this little tiny room over to the side. Okay? And it's got a comfortable chair in it. And they'll say, a doctor will be right in. That'll be a doctor of psychiatry. <laughs> the healthy don't need to go to the doctor. They need to be out on the battlefield fighting for the kingdom, using the gifts that God has given them, fully armored with the armor of protection, battling with the sword of faith. Not lounging in the emergency room just because you think you need a break. But there will be times that you will be sick and there will be times that you will be injured and there will be times that you will be in need of the great physician. That's when you fall back under the banner and protection of the intensive care unit, of the uh, mobile army surgical hospital, the MASH unit, of the trauma center, of the emergency room, which day we call the church. to be filled up, to be patched up, to be healed, to be encouraged, to be taught, to be strengthened, to be loved, to be cherished, to be filled with joy so that you can get back out there on the battlefield again. As a church and as individuals, we need to know that we are healthy. And when we as a church and as individuals are healthy, we need to go to those who are in need of spiritual health and pour ourselves into them so that they might become a vital member of our community, our community of faith, our church, our Bible studies, our service teams, and our lives. God is a good God. And it all starts with recognizing who He is and what He's doing in your life. Are you in need of a doctor today? Are you in need of a healing today? Are you an empty vessel who needs to be filled 
to the brim with the love of God? Or are you ready and raring just to get back out on the battlefield and keep fighting for the kingdom? It doesn't take a white coat to tell you that. But hopefully as you see those white coats, you'll remember that the church is a place of healing. That God is the divine and ultimate and great physician. And that through Him together, we can conquer the enemy.